It's good to be back with you this evening. So last time we worked together, we looked at um, Exodus 1 through 15, what I refer to as the Exodus proper, the actual deliverance of the Israelites from the land of Egypt. And we looked at the major theme of that whole deliverance being the knowledge of Yahweh, where he revealed himself through mighty signs and wonders. And we particularly considered uh, a twofold revelation through all that the Lord did in delivering his people out of Israel. He showed the Egyptians, his own people, and really the known world of that time that he is the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, there's a lot of creation theology there, but also that he is the king above the gods. Um, all of his signs and wonders uh, demonstrated that the entire pantheon of Egypt uh, were really no gods at all. And so uh, this is a great uh, revelation. Uh, we can even tie it into what we call natural revelation. But it isn't all that God revealed of himself. So sort of as a sub-theme under that, and for Exodus 1 through 15 again this evening, I want to look with you at the Passover uh, deliverance of God's people, look at some of the elements of it, the theology of it, and sort of how it fits into the Exodus story. And um, just to get us into uh, that text, uh, we find the Passover account, chapters 11 through 13, but primarily uh, in chapter 12. And I'll read to us some verses from Exodus chapter 12 to get our minds uh, wrapped around it. So Exodus chapter 12, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall take your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night. Roast it in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt uh, on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For the Lord will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinances. And it goes on, and there are some very important uh, instructions that we haven't read, such as you're not to allow any of the bones of this lamb to be broken while you're preparing it, uh, etc., for our purposes tonight, I want to look at how the Passover functions within the story of the exodus out of Egypt. And to get there, I want to basically look at two, two major aspects. First, the elements of the Passover sacrifice and the theology that goes with that. Then once we have the theology of Passover, then to uh, look at the role that it plays within the story, within uh, the deliverance. So there are basically... Uh, three elements of the Passover sacrifice that I want to bring out tonight. Now you could, depending on how detailed you want to be, tease it out to, to a lot more than these three. But these are three basic uh, elements. Uh, first, there's the slaying of the young lamb or the goat. And we'll see that that has to do with the idea of ransom. Uh, secondly, there is the smearing of the blood on the doorposts. And we'll look at how that has to do with the idea of purification. And then thirdly, there's also great emphasis um, 
put on the eating of the lamb. There's a lot of instructions about that, and we'll see that that has to do with the notion of consecration. So ransom, purification, consecration. I'll just touch on each of these three for a moment before we move on to the role of the Passover within the story. So the first one is the slaying of the lamb or goat and how that deals with the idea of ransoming. And we begin simply by noting that if a family did not slay this young lamb or goat in place of the firstborn son, that the Israelite firstborn son would have been slain by Yahweh just as much as uh, all those in the Egyptian households. So we have the, the, the notion here very clearly of substitution, of ransoming uh, from death. And this is emphasized all the more when we realize that for the other signs and wonders, the other plagues, God made a distinction by not allowing that plague to even come near his people. So it might be dark over the land of Egypt. It'll be light over the Israelites living in Goshen. In this case, however, he uh, brings judgment upon all the land uh, of Egypt, including where the Israelites are. Nevertheless, he declares, I am making a distinction. And what is that distinction? The distinction is that God's people have the revelation from God about how to escape. Uh, to my mind, this sort of feeds into what Paul is saying in the book of Romans. Remember when he asked that question, you know, there's so many Jews that don't believe in Christ. And he says, um, um, is it still profitable for someone to be circumcised that is to be a Jew? And he says, by all means, it's profitable. Why? Chiefly because of the oracles of God. Now, if an Israelite household decided not to believe God's um, revelation of escape, what would have happened? If they didn't obey it, well, their firstborn son would have been slain. But the follow-up question is, whose fault would that be then? In other words, is there anything amiss with the word of God? And I think Paul is making this point again in Romans. He's saying um, that God's word did not fail, but... If God's own people reject his word, then they have themselves uh, to blame. And so this is the idea, is he makes a distinction because he gives his word to his people. Uh, Paul says that's the chief blessing of being circumcised, being a Jew, being one of God's people, is to have the oracles of God. And just the fact that you and I have God's word, we have the way of escape, is amazing. It is a grace of God in itself. It is a distinction there are children growing up all around the world who have never heard the name Christ in their language, who have never um, been given this way of escape from the judgment of God, and yet his people are given to it. And so uh, we have the lamb given by God to his people, and God gives his people the lamb as a substitute for their firstborn son. Now, the firstborn son represents the whole household. And as we'll see later on, all the household is eating of the flesh of the lamb that represents the firstborn son. So the entire household is identified with the firstborn son being spared as that son is spared by the provision of a lamb from God. Now even that language I've just used now hopefully will remind some of you weeks and weeks ago um, if you were here when we looked at Genesis 22 and the near sacrifice of Isaac. And we saw that there God had asked for Abraham's firstborn son by Sarah, the son whom you love, your only son, Isaac, offer him up as a burnt offering. And yet God provided a way. Uh, Abraham told his son, God will provide a lamb. And then that, the place was called Mount Moriah, that God, the, on the mountain, God will provide. And I mentioned back then, I think, that um, in Jewish tradition, there's a link between Genesis 22 and the Passover. And we return to that idea briefly here. God will provide a lamb. Well, the first time he provides a lamb after that account is here, Exodus 11 through 13, where he provides a lamb in order for every Israelite household to be spared. And as we'll see, every household represents the nation of Israel. So in the same way, if God did not provide uh, for Isaac to be spared, all Israel would have been uh, destroyed. So now, if he did not provide this lamb, all Israel would have been destroyed in judgment as the Egyptians were as well. 
And this has been, there's just a rich tradition of seeing this robust theology. Just to give you one example, the book of Jubilees, which is not scripture, but it gives us insight into how Jews were reading uh, the Bible. It was written around 200 BC before Christ. And basically it's a commentary on Genesis and the early chapters of Exodus. Well, the author of Jubilees actually dates Genesis 22, the sparing of Isaac to Passover. And um, so that the Israelite celebration of Passover is actually a commemoration of this original event. Again, we, that's not scripture, but it's revealing to us a theology that they're making these connections uh, that I think are correct. And so when that um, lamb is slain in place of the firstborn son, that son is being ransomed from death, and that son represents the ransoming of the whole household from death. So a lot of times you'll read that the Exodus is about God delivering his people, redeeming them from bondage, and that of course is true, but it doesn't go far enough. It's not just redeeming them from slavery, but this last great sign shows that God is redeeming his people from death itself, and we'll come back to that. I'm basically out of time already, so <laughs> just get up and go uh, when you need to. Um, secondly, we have purification. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what this blood represents. Um, uh, scholars refer to what's called apotropaic, which means it wards off danger. And that's true not in a pagan notion, but it's true in the sense that when God sees the blood, he sees judgment has come, and so he spares that house. But more than that, blood, we've come to find out in Leviticus, where blood is used all over the place in the sacrificial system, and we see people sprinkled with blood when they're cured of leprosy and things like that, that blood basically represents purification. And so the idea here with the blood is that as the door frame of the house is smeared with blood, that door represents the house, and the house represents the household. And in fact, in Hebrew, the word house and household, it's the same word. And so having the doorway of the house uh, smeared with blood represents that the entire household uh, has been purified. They're not under God's judgment uh, anymore. And there's other features that tie into this. Again, besides once we get to Leviticus, it becomes pretty clear what sprinkling blood means. But we also have the instrument by which the blood is used, uh, the instrument used to strike the blood onto uh, the doorpost. If you remember, it's a hyssop branch. Hyssop branch kind of is very good for collecting that blood and able to sprinkle it. Well, hyssop Again, it's going to be used in a lot of purification ceremonies once we get into the book of Leviticus. Uh, indeed, we have a famous psalm by David when he repented, Psalm 51. And he says there in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Uh, and so we have ransoming, the first step. Secondly, purification. Incidentally, those two terms together make biblical atonement. To be ransomed from death, purified uh, from the, the guilt and stain of sin is what it takes for us to be reconciled to God at one. It's a picture of atonement. And then thirdly, we have eating the lamb. This was an act of consecration um, because it's sacrificial meat. The Passover is described as a sacrifice. And sacrifice means that that animal is not just clean, but it's been given to God. It is holy. When you eat the meat... It is sanctifying, it's sacramental in that sense. And so we have a bunch of elements in the instruction, some of which we read, that would point to the fact that this is a sacrifice. Um, it's sort of odd that God cares about how you cook it. Don't boil in water, but make sure you roast it in fire. Well, that's one feature that points to the fact that uh, this is a sacrifice. Again, when we get to the book of Leviticus, all sacrificial meat is put on the altar fire. It's roasted in that way. But also, what do you do with the leftovers? We hear that you got to burn it up um, the next day. You don't let it sit. And again, that's going to be very familiar um, legislation when we get to the book of Leviticus for the ophal and things that are left from sacrifices. Because it's holy, you don't just leave it sitting around. One of the ways you just ensure that it's not used profanely is by getting rid of it by burning it up. And so all of these laws apply to this sacrifice, and that lets us know that this sacrificial meat, again, is holy. It's designated a sacrifice. And God's people here are all, in a manner, being portrayed as priestly. They're making a sacrifice. They're partaking of the meat. They're being set aside by God. And so one scholar refers to not only this third element, but all of them put together. 
as the consecration of Israel, getting them ready to enter into covenant with Yahweh at Sinai. In fact, what's very interesting is these three elements are very familiar. Uh, They resonate. There's many parallels with the actual ordination of the priesthood of Aaron's house that we read about in Exodus 29 and Leviticus 8. So when the priesthood is going to be set aside and ordained to service, we find that there's going to be um, the slaying for the sacrifice, there's going to be the smearing of blood, and there's going to be the eating of holy meat. So that, again, one evangelical scholar talks about the Passover rituals um, being the preliminary step for Israel to become a royal priesthood and a holy nation. They're being portrayed in many ways Um, as a priestly people. So that's part of the theology of the Passover by looking at these elements. Um, It's setting God's people aside. It's not only delivering them, but it's sanctifying them. It's uh, atoning for them. It's ransoming them from the very judgment of God that's going to visit Egypt. Now then the second question we wanted to answer is how does this Passover ceremony fit into the broader story uh, of the Exodus? Um, In short, and what I'm going to try to convince you of in the next several minutes is simply this, that the Exodus is the Passover and the Passover is the Exodus. There's a lot of things that happen with the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, but this is the defining moment. This is the defining event. So take some examples of how God makes this clear. For one, um, God says, we read it there at the beginning of Exodus 12, This is now, from now on, the first month of your life, of your liturgical year. Everything starts here. Everything before this is forgotten, left behind. This is the new beginning, and that's Passover. Secondly, we see the legislation for the Passover ceremony for the generations to come. It's a bit odd, isn't it, that in the middle of this great epic story, um, there's movement, there's action, there's intensity, there's the threat of judgment, and all of a sudden we get a pause And Moses legislates uh, the Passover ceremony. This is what you do. Your son asks this question. This is what you say for your generations to come. Sort of like what Jesus does uh, on the eve of his betrayal. And so God, through uh, that Passover ceremony, guarantees that every time his people look back to the Exodus deliverance, they're wearing their Passover um, glasses. You are looking at the deliverance through the lens of the Passover. It's it's God's catechism. This is what I want you to think about more than uh, anything else. Uh, Another way to to put this is that um, the Passover was the effectual sign, and that gives it all of its gravity and emphasis and focus. So, for example, let's say that it was the plague of the frogs that led to Pharaoh. You know, we know the frogs really did bother him. They bother me, too. Um, But if that's what God used to turn Pharaoh's heart and say, all right, go, then basically uh, every spring we would have um, a lot of Jewish boys in our neighborhood playing with plastic frogs. Uh, That would be the way that they would remember the exodus out of Egypt. Uh, But that wasn't the effectual sign. That was just a warm-up. This is the effectual sign, so all the focus gets put on this. The Passover is the triggering Event. It is what actually opens the door for the Israelites um, to go free, the effectual sign. Another point to consider is that the Passover really also serves as the summary of the whole deliverance. Um, if you look back to Exodus chapter 4, we find a curious um, passage there, this is before Moses ever encounters Pharaoh. This is God's summary instruction for Moses. So Moses, when you go to talk to Pharaoh, this is what you're you're talking about. This is what the uh, deliverance is about. In Exodus 4, verses 22 and following, the Lord says to Moses, and again, this is before the first encounter, thus you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn son. So that clearly is a foreshadowing of the Passover. So think about with me 
Passover is chapters 11 through 13. Then what happens in 14? They, they cross the sea, so they're free. So 11 through 13 is the end of the plagues. Chapter 4 is before the beginning of the plagues. This is what we call literary bookends. Passover in Exodus 4, Passover 11 through 13. And what that does is it serves as a frame, lets us know everything in between is really summarized by this main event. This is the main issue. God is saying, you are abusing my firstborn son. You won't let him go to worship me. If you don't, I'm going to end up killing your firstborn son. And that's precisely what God does. Now, if you think with me a little bit further, then we got these bookends, chapter 4 through 13. We can actually spread them a little bit wider because what did Pharaoh command in the end of chapter 1? That brings us also into chapter 2. Remember, it was the last of his great attempts to destroy and uh, minimize the, the Israelites as a nation. He says, the last uh, verses of chapter 1, cast every Hebrew son who's born into the Nile. And so he is already attacking God's firstborn son. This is the seed of the serpent attacking the seed of the woman. Well, what happens in chapter 14? Chapter 14, God's people are delivered through the seas. But what happens to the, the whole Egyptian host? They are drowned in the sea. And then we get the song in chapter 15. And the song in chapter 15 actually explains what just happened in 14 by saying that it was God casting the Egyptian uh, host into the sea. Our um, mainstream scholar friends here say, ah, there must be two different traditions. Chapter 14, the chariots are running into the sea and they're being submerged. And now in chapter 15, we got this picture of God casting them into the sea. And they, they go with two different traditions, two different theologies, and it's, it's really nonsense. Uh, the song gives us the theology of what happened providentially. And that song, when it says God is casting them into the sea, is actually reminding us of chapter 1. Pharaoh was casting the Hebrew sons into the river, and this is that poetic justice. God is now casting them into the sea. So when you back it up then to chapters 1 through 15, you realize that the entire deliverance out of Egypt is summarized by this Passover event where God delivers his firstborn son while executing those of the Egyptian host. And so the literary structure shows us that the Passover is all about, um, or the Exodus, I should say, is all about the Passover. So now comes the, the question, what does this add to the story of the Exodus? Well, our major theme is knowing Yahweh, uh, the revelation of Yahweh. This is one of the major um, elements that have been lacking throughout history. Remember, the, the, the presence of God, but also the knowledge of God. He's going to reveal the knowledge of himself before he brings his people into his presence. So what does the Passover add to that theme? And I think it's quite simple. Yahweh wanted to be known by his people as their redeemer. And this is, gets us into special revelation. It's, we need that natural revelation. We need that understanding that God is the maker, the creator of heaven and earth, that he is the king above all the gods. No one compares to him who is like you, O Lord. But how much sweeter for this same God you'd be able to embrace and say, he is my redeemer. This is the one who delivered me from death through the blood of the lamb. He provided that lamb that I may go free. He delivered me from bondage. He delivered me from death. He's my redeemer. And it's that extra aspect that is precious, particularly to the people of God, I think that would have led the mixed multitude to say, hey, we want to go with them. We want to be a part of the people of God. What would have led Rahab to say, I want to be a part of the people of God? What would lead the nations in the old covenant where you do have to become a Jew, as it were, to become the people of God, this is why you'd want to, because he's the redeemer of his people. They are his family, and he will do whatever it takes in order to set them free, to deliver them from death. And so let me summarize um, the, the, the plot of the Exodus this way. Um, the Exodus is about the redemption of God's firstborn son from death. The redemption of God's firstborn son from death. So Israel is my son, my firstborn son, and they're going to be redeemed from death through the shed blood of the Lamb. But already we get a view into the new Exodus of the New Testament. 
Um, the Passover is what opens the gate. So if the cross of Christ is the Passover, what's the new exodus? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Well, we wouldn't really use the word redemption for Jesus. He accomplished our redemption. Nevertheless, the scriptures talk about him being delivered from death. I mean, the irony is that in the new exodus, it's God who wakes up to find his own firstborn son dead. And yet we know that the pangs of death could not contain him. So that even in the new exodus, we have the deliverance of God's firstborn son from death. And as we are united to him by faith through the Holy Spirit, we experience our exodus. We are united to that Passover and then united to his resurrection so that we are dead to the old age, alive to the new. Well, I introduced the, the concept of literary bookends. Let me just touch on literary bookends in the Gospel of John, and then I'll close this in prayer. So John, in chapter 1, verse 29, introduces Jesus with these beautiful words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And once you've introduced a character by that uh, picture, that's who he is for the rest of the story. And we get a bookend near the end of his gospel in chapter 19 when Jesus is crucified. John's gospel is the only one that mentions this event because he has the Passover theology in mind. When the soldiers came to break the bones of those who were on the cross in order for them to suffocate and expire, they came to Jesus and he was already dead. So the soldiers did not have to break the bones of his leg. And John says, this is to fulfill the Passover legislation that not one of his bones should be broken. So on the cross, John uh, focuses our eyes on Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb who is slain. The firstborn son is not spared. He comes as the Passover lamb that we who partake of his flesh, as you will next Lord's Day, and identify ourselves with him, we will experience his deliverance from death, his resurrection. By dying with him, we also rise with him. And so by using those bookends, John is letting us know, aside from which he's the only gospel that is continually mentioning Passover. He mentions Passover like some 10 times, shows Jesus' um, events taking place, three different Passovers. Uh, this is John's theology from beginning to end, and then he gives us the book of Revelation, and how, who, how is Jesus introduced there? The lamb slain, uh, standing as if slain. Um, this is where John bids us to look. We look to Christ. He is the one whose blood purifies us. His death is our substitute, ransoms us from death. And by partaking of him, we are sanctified. And so we praise God for providing, ultimately, the lamb he provides is his own dear firstborn son. Let's pray. Our great God, how we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he loved us and laid down his life for us. We thank you that you loved us and did not spare him but that you have ransomed us from your own judgment of death and hell, which we deserved. And you have given us the hope of eternal life and glory uh, together with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a new creation. Lord, we pray that that would be our joy and our hope amidst the trials of this fleeting and um, dark age. We pray that the light of your people would shine as stars of the night, and we do pray, God, that you would revive your church and cause an awakening throughout the land here and throughout the ends of the earth, uh, that our children's children uh, would be able to uh, delight in the Sabbath day without uh, persecution or fear. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being with us this evening. We pray for your blessing to go with us into the week now in Jesus' name. Amen.